Welcome to the Songwriters Across Texas podcast. This state has a lot to offer, and music is one of its greatest exports. On this podcast, we get to know songwriters through their stories and hear some of their music. Today, we're at Arlen Studios, and my guest is Johnny Gowdy. I'm Carl Anderson, and this is the Songwriters Across Texas podcast. He was born in Miami, but grew up in the Woodlands and the Houston area. He loved music, but he couldn't bring himself to sing in the choir. See, Johnny Gowdy was edgier. He liked groups like Cheap Trick, and when he saw them at 13, he was in for a musical life, all in. His mother was a huge music fan and had many friends in the music scene in Austin. With that out of the picture, Johnny and his mom moved around a little bit, spending time in Austin. They spent time in Lake Tahoe, Marin County, lots of places. But they finally settled in Austin, and Johnny started playing as much as he could, including in a band called Cry Wolf with his mom's friend and Carol King's producer, Mark Hallman. Tragedy struck the still 16-year-old Johnny Gowdy's life when his mother was beaten so badly one night that she lost her life 18 days later. Johnny had a lot of support from his family and friends in Austin, and he stayed there, and he stayed true to his path. He's had several major bands, including the infamous Mr. Rocket Baby, and his Gowdy release Peep Show was one of the first releases on Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich's short-lived label, TMC. He has produced albums, he's been popular party band Skyrocket for 20 years, he also has over 1,200 shows on his podcast, How Did I Get Here? I love this cat, Johnny Gowdy is like my brother from another mother, and I am welcoming him with great joy to the show. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Carl. It's It's, great to be here. It's so good to have you. Let's bust right in. Oh, Johnny has Gabe Rhodes with him, ladies and gentlemen. Gabe is... (laughs) The great Gabriel Rhodes. The great Gabriel Rhodes, so we're in for a treat. All right. Something in the way that you hide From anything that's beautiful Anything you need to survive You hoard it like a child And it keeps you So remotely free, yeah But do you believe the sun revolves around the earth? Earth revolves around the moon. Moon revolves around you. Moon revolves around the earth. Earth revolves around the sun. Sun revolves around everyone. When I paint your picture on a stone. Throw the stone into the sea It's floating like a leaf The weight of waiting for you Is just like overcoming gravity And I don't want to go But I don't believe The sun revolves around the earth Earth revolves around the moon Moon revolves around you Moon revolves around the earth Earth revolves around the sun Sun revolves around everyone Without having to leave So you can be free To believe The sun revolves around the earth Earth revolves around the moon Moon revolves around you Moon revolves around the earth Earth revolves around the sun Sun revolves around everyone 
sun revolves around the earth earth revolves around the moon moon revolves around you moon revolves around the earth earth revolves around the sun sun revolves around everyone Wow, beautiful. Yeah. Really gorgeous. Good song. You know, I wrote that song with our old friend Mark Addison. I didn't know. When remember when he had the band The Borrowers? I yeah. It I, was it was the was first song on their here. second record. Was that okay. song? Yeah. And you wrote it with Different him. Different version. Yeah. Yeah. That did you write that here with him? Uh huh. Because yeah. he came from Cali, right? He came from Cali. But yeah. I met I met him here. I got you. Yeah. Got you. You didn't meet him in Cali, but you no. we had been in Cali enough. I'm gonna uh do something a little different because I usually I'm like, all right, let's just start talking about your life and stuff. But right. uh, but we have a lot of history and like the very similar timings when my ex wife Casey uh, yep. Crowley right. and we so, and yeah and it was such a lovely time in Hyde Park, yeah. you know. Uh, and yeah, we yeah. weren't the only musicians there. No, you know, Bob lived like up the street from me for a while, and Patty yeah. Griffin, right? Miles and Zuniga, Miles and Spencer Gibb, Spencer Gibb, Anar. Ain't Jeff up, Klein. Jeff Klein, exactly. Renee Woodward. Renee Woodward. Uh, pa- Patty Griffin. Did yeah, we say that Yeah, lots of people. Yet? Yeah, Patty Griffin. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Troy well, Campbell. I mean, she was such a heavy name that she counts twice. She ca- yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I said Troy it, Campbell. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. Yeah, yeah, it was just such a cool time, and we all we all got to really get into the business together and having, and, and, I, and Casey and I even got to be there for some of your fun things. So I just wanted to start with that so people understood how yeah, we yeah. knew each other. Yeah, yeah. And that makes me. Those I, were good times. They were, and they, it's just I I love having you here and then talking about. It. I love doing the show and, and and kind of tying all those stories together. Right. And you're such a perfect person to that exemplifies what it means to do this thing from day one. Yeah. Uh, the cheap trick. Thank all you. That, you know. Yeah. Tell me tell me about that be, being young experience for you. You're moving around an awful lot. Yeah, I'm. You know, my mom was just kind of like restless and trying to find her place. Mm-hmm. You know, she was a. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, like, you know, a lot of those, a lot of people were trying to find themselves, which is understandable. Like, look at us, you know, here we are at our age, still, like, exactly. trying looking. Exactly. Um, but uh, but that was that that was her, trying to find her people, her place. And, you know, living in the Woodlands, she was a single mom, and that's a place where families live. So Right, like it's a, also, a family development? Is that it, what you're saying? Well, it's like a, a planned community. Planned community. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, which isn't conducive for single life stuff. So when we moved here to Austin, then she was able to really get out and like, you know, right. really go and see bands on almost a nightly basis. Right. Yeah. Did she take you with her? Yeah, she took me with her. But then, you know, by the time we moved here, I was like 15 and 16. Okay. And you didn't really want to go like hanging with your mom. Right. And it's like, it was, it's at that time where you're like, yeah, you kind of want to meet some chicks or something. It's absolutely. Were you, <laughs> were you getting into bars? At 15? Yeah, I, I was. I, think I was. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I knew people. Of course. Our mutual friend, Will Sexton, he was younger than me, and we were going together to places. Good. I'm yeah. glad that yeah. and I'm, they, you should have been able. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, that's one of the things that's remember, great about Austin. I have this distinct memory of going to see uh, Michael Ramos and uh, and David Grissom. A, yeah. Oh, wow. They were playing in Lou Ann Barton's band, oh, wow. but at like a bar bar, not like at a venue or anything. It's like a bar bar, right. like a three-set show or whatever. So I went to go sit there for the whole thing because I was a kid, and I loved those guys. Mm-hmm. And I remember standing outside like in the cold waiting for Michael to take a break so he could come get me in <laughs> or talk to the people at the right. door to get me in, yeah. And Michael's older too, right? I mean, a little bit older than yeah. me, not that much, but he is a few years older. He doesn't age though. No. That guy looks incredible. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Still so talented too. Oh yeah, he he's. I've seen him band, you know, be the band leader at the events. Yeah, and yeah. That to me is one of those things where like I, when I see Charlie do that or, or Michael or somebody, when right. the band leader, that's a real, that's a damn thing to do. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not they, they don't tap me for that. But <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was they in a, sh- I was, in liars and I, I know, but that's a lot of that. Like, I know what those guys, I was in one of those things for the Dudley and Bob 25th anniversary okay, thing. Yeah. And Scrappy was the band leader and I was in the band and I sang a song. Scrappy had a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> it was no, a lot yeah, of work, yeah. No, that's a job. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. And I think uh, the George Reef thing, uh, the first one that was at Emo's, or maybe it was the second, like after he had already passed. Uh-huh. Um, I remember that one, like Charlie 
music directed half the show and scrappy music directed half the show. Uh-huh. So, yeah. That good combo. Yeah. Well, everybody wanted to get in with George and, and you know, pay their respects. Celebrate, yeah. And celebrate yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah. He's such a... Um, a missed, uh, but he's not missed because he just lives so he much. Is missed. I mean, he's missed yeah. by us. Yeah, he, he's missed playing and and, co- and coaching people. Coaching people. Yeah, he's like one of the best at that that there was. Yeah, and lots of people come on the show and talk about George, and I love it when they do because he, you know, every he touched everybody so so much. I know that we we had talked about working together for a long time, and I remember doing shows where there'd be like five people there. Um, and then he would be like in the doorway and you always knew it was, you knew it wasn't Anar cause like in this, as a shadow, they both kind of look exactly like, <laughs> right. but one guy actually had hair. Right. So that was George. That was George. I knew it was him. He's a little bit taller too than us. Yeah, uh, he was. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I miss him. There was a, if you don't mind, I, no, please. I, I was going through a really hard time in 2004. I was, uh, separating from my ex-wife at the time and it was a very heavy heavy time and i was on tour with this band called endosheen yeah i was playing guitar and keyboards with them and uh we played this big festival in nashville and it was like all kinds of people like the strokes were the headliners and like uh i think that i th- i'm pretty sure george was playing guitar or playing bass with uh with chris robinson from black Crows. oh yeah he did play with him for and a then while. we played and so there was a thing in the afternoon we i guess we had played and i was walking and i was going in between buses i was literally in tears like oh this is the worst time of my life and a bus door opened and george walked out and goes hey man what are you doing here <laughs> And then what? he proceeded to take me for a two-hour walk and, like, conciliary, like, tell me what's wrong, buddy. And wow. turned into a much better day than it was. That's such a t- t- yeah. crazy story. Yeah. I, lo- I love stories like that because it's like, you know, it, it's a God moment, really. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're so down. You're, yeah. you're out of sorts. You're in between these two buses randomly, it seems. And who's there, the guy you need the most? Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. The, Pretty amazing. The best thing I can relate to that was I was helping my buddy carry this really big TV from a, a room down an elevator, and we're in the elevator, mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm not going to make this. I'm not going to make it to the car, and I don't know how to put it down, and I'm this is I'm getting nervous. And the elevator door opened, and there was like a, a football player who was oh. like 6'6", six, six, and he's like, need a hand? I thought you were going to say, like, George, the elevator opened and George Reef grabbed my <laughs> side of it and walked out. I, I, I should have said yeah. that and just and stuck with it. But yeah. it was, but it was. No, that's a good story. Well, yeah. it was a similar thing. Yeah. I, right when I was thinking, Someone's I'm about there to carry to the load. Be messed up. Some big hand comes in and, and takes care of things. Yeah, what's the religious thing where there's the. the, the I, I was tired walking down the beach oh, and the two, the somebody feet. picked me up yeah. and carried me, but there was only two footsteps. And, and I was, was George yeah, Reef. Th- <laughs> <laughs> George was carrying you. That was when I was carrying you is what George said. Yeah. yeah. How come How come you abandoned me at this time? Right, right, I right. Was I was carrying you. you. Exactly right. That, That's what That was. was George All doing right. it. Um, cool. All right. So you... You were getting into the bars in Austin early. You're yeah. watching stuff. You're connecting with Will Well, I was playing with, with Mark, too, at that time, like, so I could I could get into play. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the Mark, I mean, that's just an incredible thing as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he really took me under his wing. You know, he didn't have kids at the time, and I think he was at the time of his life where he was ready to share this wisdom of his life. And also, like, uh, yeah, I don't, I can't, I can't imagine what my musical upbringing, and also personal, like, once I met him, there was a lot of guidance in my life, like um, great guidance. Yeah, like a like a, a dude kind of being like, "Don't do that, man." <laughs> right. <laughs> don't, do, uh, don't don't wear those shoes with those pants. <laughs> like, he was totally that guy too. Like, don't, you can't wear that jacket with that shirt, man. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I will. Yeah, yeah it's like life stuff. Music stuff and fashion stuff, hair stuff, lots of great conversations. But you ha- that's good because like all that if you have the right person telling you that, yeah. It matters in show business. Of course. You know, that you look cool. Yeah. And sharp. Of course. You got yeah. a style. Yeah. You know, and that you sometimes pay big for that. You know, like you yeah. wear you're you're on stage and it's a hundred degrees out and you're wearing a coat because it's Looks good. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. Showmanship, Carl. baby. Yeah. That's I'm not going to show up in shorts and tivas for a concert. Hell, what am no. I doing? What? Yeah. What? Who does that? There is probably, a lot of people. The, but. the one, the one, <laughs> the only guy I know that wears shorts on stage that can get away with it is Angus Young. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's good guy. It. I thought you were going to say Jimmy Buffett or something, but no. 
Um, I mean, I don't know what his deal is. I he think can, he, he can do whatever he wants, I guess. Sure. <laughs> Jimmy's cool. Yeah. He wrote Margaritaville in Austin. He did. That's in cool. Austin? Yeah. I didn't I read that recently. He was wow. here and he and somehow he wrote it. Did he that. record here? I don't think he rec- I don't oh. think he recorded it here. I think he wrote it here. Oh. That's, did that's did you ever come here when Bearwald had the room? Before he moved his stuff into his house? No, I okay. spent a lot of time at Bearwald's house. So. Yeah. Bearwald. Bearwald. David Bearwald. Say hi, David Bearwald. Hi, David Bearwald. Bu- David we, bu- Bearwald. You, you did a record at, at his yes. studio, The Palindrome. I used to experience da- so David Bearwald at like 7.30 in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how are you guys doing this morning? <laughs> That's good. That's good. Me and, me and him, uh, he, t- he, he was like, I started writing a screenplay with him about this time he had in his life with Will Sexton. It was like this four-day really wild ride and I was like I'll write I hadn't written that sounds a, awesome I hadn't written a screenplay at that point but I was like I'll write so we spent a lot of time together uh writing that and drinking uh yeah Herodura <laughs> silver which I, I I always like tequila but uh he said Will showed me how to drink this right, right. you sip it you sip you it. don't need any salt right. and any wine nothing you sip it you just get a good enough tequila and you could yeah, yeah. I remember Will yelling at me so, about that yeah and I went through a big phase where I was like I'm just on this hair doer stuff and I'm sipping it yeah it's a good time that's what you gotta do that's, sometimes that's what you gotta do um let's it's fifteen sixteen. This tragedy happens. I mean, sixteen. Yeah, uh, uh, she she was it. I mean, it happened. I'm uh, sixteen, but it was the day before my seventeenth birthday. So it's like October thirteenth, but October fourteenth is my birthday. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be born on October thirteenth. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that is just some heavy. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. But Todd no, was born I, on October thirteenth. I'm like, but you, yeah, no, it's. I'm always so surprised, and and even back when I met you, because it was, you know, there was no, you hadn't come to like it's been resolved twenty three right. years later, right. which is we should talk about in a second. But but it wasn't then, and you know, no. I, but I always felt like it, it. I knew, you know, we knew it had happened to you, and that it was a obviously a big deal, but it didn't carry over into anything that you were doing that would affect like you weren't this brooding sad no, guy. I kind of was. Yeah. Were you? Yeah, yeah. And not around yeah, me you were. Yeah. No, I kept I mean I kept it in, but yeah, there was a I mean there was a lot I had to deal with at, you know, one point in my life and still dealing today, you know, with it. Right. But um but no, I mean it it did. It it was also like I never talked about it then. That was one right. thing that I, I know I never did because there are people that would find out about like from somebody else who knew me real well and be like, whoa, did you? And like, whoa, why didn't you ever say that? Right. And my deal was, was like everyone would be having a good time and then you'd say this thing and everyone's like, oh, man. Yeah. And it killed the, <laughs> it would kill, right. the kill the vibe for people. But um, but uh, once, once, uh, once they found the guy that did it, and I mean a lot of stuff has happened. They found the guy that did it. He got convicted. But then also... They, uh, uh, some, uh, nonprofit that helps people that whatever get out of jail, uh, he got out. Oh, wow. And, but, but it's, it's, it, he wasn't totally forgiven. There's just like, hey, you can't keep a guy in jail until new evidence comes in. So if there's new evidence someday, then he'll go in. That's, that's, Uh-oh. yeah. So they, they but, get, but they, hold on, because okay, yeah. the thing is, is like, there's always like this weird thing. I know that they were right. I don't think that because he got out on appeal that he didn't do it. Right. So mm-hmm. I just realized that there was uh, so much time in between uh, the event happening and my mom being attacked and dying and, and it being solved that just the fact that I knew, cause I didn't know who it was. And right. in fact, when they found out who it was, I had a really hard time. I was like, are you sure? Because... I don't think like you know what I really? mean. Like my mom could beat that guy up. You know right. what I mean. Like yeah. it was that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, you know. But w- w- I mean, once it was presented to me and all the evidence was, then I was like, oh man, you're definitely right about this. But I will say that uh, those guys worked really hard and and really proved beyond uh, reasonable doubt that he had he had committed this this crime. And, um, and it changed my life from that day on, regardless of what happened afterwards. I get it. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm glad to, I I remember that was such big news and so everybody who knew you, you know, we all, did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Cause we knew it would have to be a relief for you. 
It was a huge relief. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to carry around uh, wounds. Everybody has them. Right. Everybody's going to have some abandonment issue, uh, and it's usually with one parent or other. Uh, and it doesn't have to be because they left you. It could just be because they didn't have your back at a certain point. Exactly. You know, everybody exactly has all right. kinds of weird damage. Yeah. You know, and you got to do. I lost my mom when I was three, right? And that stays with you. But like, I now I know how to talk to her. You know, like I feel oh, her. Yeah, yeah I right. feel her, and I and I'm like, I don't feel like I'm abandoned at all. Yeah, and that me neither. Took me a long time to get there. Yeah, you know, a thing that I noticed. Uh, I want to say like seven or eight years ago, I was I was very drunk. I might have seen you there. I know I saw you there. <laughs> Uh, it was at the Austin Music Awards, and I'd had a lot to drink. And I was with somebody that was from out of town, and we were walking around, and we went to a place afterwards, and, and she was like, man, you're, all those people in that room, like it was like the backstage scene. Yeah. And it was just like so much love, and everyone's just hugging each other, and people stealing each other's vape pens, and God knows what. <laughs> and, um, but like everyone, like Ian Moore, Sarah Hickman, mm-hmm. Gary Clark Jr., uh, Bill Carter, uh, I, you know, Margaret Moser was still alive. Right. Todd Wolfson was there. Probably you were there. Right. People were there, you know. And uh, and and it, I got to another place, and when she was saying that, it all hit me at once. And I just started crying, and I was like, oh, we moved here, like, before she died, and she kind of set me up with all of these people that would end up being my chosen family for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it didn't dawn on me. Like, can't believe it took me that long. I'm that dumb. But I finally realized, like, in my 40s, like, oh, she really did, like, leave me in the care of, yes. of the people that would go on to be my people for, you know. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a nice... I'm really fortunate. About and I feel like I have a little bit more... And I'm not saying I'm more connected. I'm saying my personal attachment to this scene might be a little deeper than I even thought it was. Like, I need it to live. Like, these are my people. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so glad you came to that. And I'm, you kind of brought a tear to my eye. And so Sorry. I went, no, I'm glad you did. I don't get a tear in my eye very much. I love you, Johnny. I think it's time for another song. Yeah? I do. Uh, right. Do you have one in mind? I do. I have a song that I wrote with our mutual friend, Jeremy Nail, who's oh, been yeah. on the show. Oh, yeah. Awesome. On this show. Yeah, you sure uh, You were in a band with him. I was in a band with him called Liars and, and Saints. And Casey Crowley. And Casey Liars. Crowley. Yeah. yeah. That's right. The great Joe Hummel, Pally Pal. Great. That's right. Joey, Joey yeah. and Pally Pal. So uh, I wrote this song with Jeremy, and uh, it's called Let Me Be Your Man. Two, three, four... I didn't sleep at all last night And I know I'm running out of time And I'm getting into trouble over you I stumbled through this sleepy town The fog was thick when I laid down It's hard enough to get the message through Where do I begin Before I give my heart again See, I've taken all the damage that I can Baby, won't you please let me be your man I followed you through thick and thin You pushed me out, you let me in You kept me hanging on by a thread You can play the victim or the thief And either way it's fine with me But I don't want to leave before I've said Where do I begin Before I give my heart again I've taken all the damage that I can Baby, won't you please let me be your man Yeah. 
where do I begin before I give my heart again see I've taken all the damage that I can baby won't you please let me be your man oh let me be your man won't you let me be your man that song was killer thank you thank you the co-write with jeremy nail uh you were in that band liars and saints yes. with Jeremy for a couple years with uh, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Casey, Casey Crowley, Crowley uh, Joe Hummel, Joe Pally Joey Pally. Hummel, and Pally 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 Pal Paladino. Yeah, these are that's a hell of a band. Yeah, what was that like? It was fun, man. Uh, you know, it was real fun because you know I started that band with Joe. Like with it was Joey me and Joe. Hummel. Yeah, like yeah. we. He was like, I don't, I don't. His dad died. Okay. And I think I had just I didn't know him very well. But I just wrote him on Facebook like, hey, I'm sorry, that's his drag. My mom died. Give me a call if you want. And he did. And we went to lunch. And then we started a band at lunch. <laughs> and then we just like looked for people for like six. I mean, we knew Pally was going to be in it. But then I was like, I really had like this idea of uh, of of like the Eagles. Like yeah. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And having vocal harmonies and like other people different sing and mm -hmm. you don't have to write all the songs. And so, yeah, totally. Yeah. But it, well, it was, it was an interesting experience for you. You ended up kind of being almost like the band director. I feel like I was, I think, I think everybody there would agree with me. And I think that's just naturally also like, um, what would happen? Somebody would sort of fall into. If that no role. one does it, I do it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like if I, I I talk to people on my podcast, and you can you can find out who somebody is uh, their archetype by saying like, did you join a band or did you start a band? Uh -huh. Like which one did you do first? Like right. I started one. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna exactly. be cool. And I've got this idea of what we're. And I'm I, I naturally do do that, but I also enjoy like you know uh, being an endosheen. Right. Being uh, playing with Ian Moore, you know, for a year and what, touring do, with him. Do you play keys on that one too? I play guitar and keys. Uh, stand getting to stand next to somebody like that every night and see them mm -hmm. do their thing, on like the that they're known for. Them. And I mean, right. you know, we might take Ian for granted because we came up with him or something. But man, you stand next to that guy every night and you learn a lot of stuff, man. I bet a lot. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Music stuff, but also like performance stuff. How you, you know. Yeah, everything. How to talk too much about like electronics to lose a crowd. But <laughs> <laughs> that was something I used to give my hard time about. But um, I, I, don't, I don't mind doing either one. In fact, I like being able to go between the two of them. Because it makes me. me not hate. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, or, also, or get you don't really want it to be all about you all the time anyway, at least probably at this point, I would think. In some ways I do, but, <laughs> but there are times when I don't. Like I'm, right. I'm willing to like, it's not about me, it's about your thing, and I just want to learn how to like make it work better. I think as, you know? An, you know, for, as an actor, for me, it was all, that was part of what I liked about it. I was like, so, and people would write things for me to yeah. do, and that's a, like a, one of the highest compliments you can get. Hey, yeah. I wrote a play. I wrote the, like they'd call for like, for like two years, everyone would write me a part, and they, they, I was like, what's his name? Carl. <laughs> it's like, you could at least change the name, man. <laughs> but it was also like the greatest compliment at yeah. the same time, you know? I'm like... Well, yeah. I, I don't have a... Like, I, I think that that's probably like a lot of actors, as they get older, they do this too, is that you just kind of feel like, you know... I just want to be part of stuff that's fun and cool. I don't care if I'm the leading man. Yes. I don't care if I'm the guy... You know, with three lines. I just exactly. I just want to be in cool stuff. I don't want to cool be people. in the background, though. No, I don't. No, I'm not saying featured extra or no, anything. Yeah. I'm saying I still want to have like a character actor. I gotta thing. have I gotta <laughs> have something to do in my scene that's right. part of the story. Yeah, and then I'll be there. Yeah, if I like it. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Okay, so you had these side bands, but then you had you were the in the front of Mr. Rocket Baby. Yeah, well, that was another du that was a dual front man. Oh, okay. Uh, with Richard Weiss. Oh, who is okay. now an uh, architect guy. I think he was trying to do something with this next-door building. Oh, yeah, that's a right. A while ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He might have come in here at one, one day uh, when we were in here. I feel like somebody was walking around. Could he might have. Yeah. He might have very well come in. But we, we, we I, I want to say, I mean, I know that 
and this is not, not, I just think I wrote more songs than he did. And so it wasn't like a 50, 50 kind of thing or like liars and saints was definitely three thirds. It was definitely like a couple of few songs a show, maybe three or four songs a show, or maybe five. At uh-huh. some point he kept on growing and doing more, but, but it was a dual front man thing. And it also was like a real band thing. And that, I mean, I honestly like, um, I, I knew what I wanted to do before I had the people. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, this is what I want it to be. Mm-hmm. I wanted to kind of focus on living in an era that's no longer, that you can no longer live in, which kind of sets you up to have a Saturday morning cartoon because I always wanted to have a band that, but I, I don't think I've ever been in a band that was more perfect for a Saturday morning cartoon. We just didn't get famous enough. You did, you did get cartoon. some acclaim though. I mean, yeah, yeah. You, when I got here, that band was, I think, and still, it was it was it was about to fold, maybe at ninety five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was folding. It was it, sad. It was, it was in that. But there was, was a lot of that, talk there was like about half it. the band was gone. There's a couple. Anar was in the band. Uh-huh. We had a purple mohawk yeah, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. mohawk yeah, back yeah. then. That's amazing. <laughs> but the original band, there was something real special about the chemistry. Of nothing against Anar, nothing against you know Kevin Lance, who are you know just as good, probably better than the guys who originally started. But there is something about you know what I mean. Yeah, there's yeah. something about the original Absolutely. people that's kind of magical, and there was something real goofy about our thing at the beginning that uh-huh. I think people really gravitated to. Tell me about Gowdy, the, the band Gowdy, the record. That was a tour de force, the whole experience. The whole experience. Well, I mean, yeah. you, you, you don't... You were around for that. I, know, I mean, I look, was, I don't have time for the whole story. No, we, we What don't. happens is, is uh, 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 guys that were doing a local and regional thing, me and Anar and, and, and Kyle Schneider were going around doing this trio, playing for sometimes five nights a week, really working hard, spinning wheels to make, uh, to make ends meet. And we weren't moving forward career wise. There was nothing like we just, were just trying to get to the next gig to right. do the thing. And we got this manager that I met through our mutual friend, Todd Wolfson, nice. uh, this guy named Martin Hanlon, who, uh, Scottish dude, you remember him? Yeah. Oh yeah. He, uh, he just kind of taught us to look at ourselves f- objectively. Mm-hmm. which is real hard to do as an artist, as any kind of creator. It's hard to look at something and be like, yeah, you know. Especially I, when you're I, young. I, I would go in, but I'd probably leave after three songs. You know what I mean? Right. It's difficult. So um, so we learned that one thing. We do, we, we, we buckled down. He brought all of these people into our sphere, uh, Jane Weedlin and her husband at the time, Jed Malone, uh, uh, Jim Kerr from Simple Minds, his wow. brother, Paul Kerr. Then we had this giant uh, uh, management team that just pushed and like within, you know, eight or nine months of putting our nose to the grindstone, we were, you know, offered deals. And then we ended up signing with Lars Ulrich for Metallica. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, we went to California, we worked on these records with people that we, you know, Casey worked to. Yeah. Well, we worked in Bearwald studio. He, he didn't, I mean, he did offer to play a lot on our record. (laughs) Sure. he did. I have a great quote where he came out one night and he goes, the song sounds great. You know what it needs. We're like, no, what? And he goes, me. <laughs> That's the best, the best That's line. Such a good impersonation. Um, so, uh, so um, we made this record and and got away from who but we Fred were as Marr, a band did he with did, Fred Marr. Yeah, yeah. so um, he did Casey's record too. That's right. So interesting. Okay. Well, so we threw the Scrimi record away. Bloody. Unfortunately, not Fred Marr's fault, but just kind of the situation. The communication between us was bad and all this stuff. So, oh yeah, I remember we that. ended up getting back with Mike McCarthy, who we had done all of our demos with came to Austin, recorded, and uh, and then this guy, Jack Joseph Puig, mixed it. And then the record came out, and I think that by the time the record came out, the Lars Nar- Napster fight had oh, started. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, it's just lousy timing. Yeah, and no one no one at that label was really excited about us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Except was, a couple of publicists. I got you. And they, so you were kind of, in the end, it was like, okay, well, we got the here record, are, these and guys, we got to get out of yeah, here. Yeah, we spent two budgets on the record. Like We spent that's, so much more than we were supposed to. Being it's on, insane. Having been on the inside of that with Casey and watching how money gets spent and stuff, I, yeah. it's just insane. Yeah. It really is. And uh, but, and you, it's no wonder it doesn't happen that way anymore. Because right, right, it right. Doesn't. Yeah, no, no, that's, that was definitely crazy. <laughs> and we got to wrap it up. But yeah, before we wrap it. it up, we're going to talk about Mike McCarthy, okay, who, who saved the day on, on, the, on the thing. Because I always think of, I have this perfect memory of you talking about being in the studio with him. And you're like, yeah, Mike's great. He's not afraid to cut the tape. Yeah. And like, I was like, that's rad. And, you, you yeah. tell, and I was like, so 
explain that. Okay, so, uh, dude, we did a couple of things that are super awesome with him. Okay, so that Peep Show was kind of the end of tape. Like, that was the last yes. year and a half that people were making records on tape. So we're lucky enough we got to do that. And um, the, I can't remember cutting tape on Peep Show, but I do remember we made a tape loop. Like, we made the... The, the 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 drum loop right uh, on you can see this in the BG's documentary. There's a real good documentation of them doing it. And what you do is you take a piece of tape and you glue it together so it's a circle. So it just goes around and around and around. So uh -huh. you find the four bars of the drum beat that work. And it like they took uh, from staying alive. The drummer's mom died and he left in 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 the Bee Gees. And they took Saturday Night Fever drums and just slowed it down a little bit. And that's Night Fever drums. No way. It's just the same thing, just slow Holy down cow. a little bit. Yeah. So they show how you do it. Like you have to, it takes a bunch of people and you put the you you put the you physically put the tape around. There has to be a guy like holding it like with a microphone stand, and then it just goes around and you record that two-track tape onto the 24 track. It's awesome. That's it's so a, awesome. But Mike would cut like their the editing like one would do in Pro Tools or in a computer these days, where you just like cut, you can see where all the all of the Yeah, you know, the the, 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 the lines. The lines <laughs> and all the stuff. You can see where they're getting bigger as well. But this is like literally like <laughs> and then you take this this you lay it down on the thing and you take this razor and you cut it and you put it back together and you just hope to God that you right. did it right. But Mike could do it, man. He was like a he was like a a, a, a Jedi. Yeah, ex that, yeah. That's ex like, and I love that you're getting so. When oh, you're dude, telling me now, so you're remembering. Exciting. It's so exciting. And I'm, I'm aren't you glad you got to be I'm a so part glad. of that yeah. tape yeah. cutting yeah. session? Yeah. Well, I'm awfully glad that I got to be a part of yeah. your life, your and and being having you guys here and you here and telling your story. I, I it means a lot to me, John. Thanks, man. It means I, a lot to me too. I love you a lot. Carl. I love you, my yeah. brother. I always have. Me too, man. I want to thank Gabe. I love him too. Gabe, I love you too, buddy. Gabriel, you always do such a nice job. Awesome. Okay, we got one more. What's it going to be? I got one more for us. Yes, I do. This is a song that Gabriel and I wrote called Marigolds, and uh, you can find it out there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we wrote this song during the 2020 pandemic lockdown over Zoom, we actually did, didn't we? Oh, cool. Yeah, and we recorded it. Our friends, uh, uh, John Chipman, Scott Garber, and uh, the great Noel Hampton from Bell Sounds sang on it. So, yeah, all of them. Excellent. Yeah, you ready? All the crowns of Mary Golden, not one seems to fit. I'm having trouble letting go and getting on. Nobody knows They only see what I show Minutes turn to hours Somehow hours turn to years Another new day Asking myself How did I get here? No one can see no one can see It's a waste of time Building cards with catastrophe Read between the lines If you look hard enough of me still shines Reflected from the dreams we had a witness to the crime and no one can tell There's no mirrors in hell It's a waste of time Shuffling cards with catastrophe Read between the lines Hard enough, you'll find me. Oh. 
All your life you stand up straight and never shed a tear When inside you're terrified and hiding all your fear And nobody tells There's no mirrors in hell It's a waste of time Shuffle the cards with catastrophe Read between the lines If you look hard enough You'll find me Find me That's Johnny Gowdy and Gabe Rhodes, ladies and gentlemen. Are you just johnnygowdy.com? Yep, that's J-O-H-N-N-Y-G-O-U-D-I-E. right. Exactly right. And then Y G O U D I E dot com. Uh, go check him out over there. And uh, Gabe, what are you, you got? Gabe Rhodes dot com. Is that what? Gabe G A B E R H O D E S dot com. Yeah. And uh, please hit the like or subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you're listening to this podcast and you want to watch it, go on YouTube and Songwriters Across Texas, Johnny Gowdy episode. And check some other things out too while we're at it. Yeah. Thanks again for being here. Thanks guys. for having Wonderful. us, man. Thanks, Gabe.